was pretty well on its way out, I guess. I guess, let's see, was Franklin Roosevelt president? Yeah, I guess he <laughs> was president. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh -huh. Do you have memories of uh, growing up in rural Arkansas? That, that was, it was rural, what, that part of the country? It was a small town. Our town had probably at that time under 10,000 people, uh, or around 10,000. Camden was the county seat of our county, Washita County. Washita County and, uh, was named for the Washita River, and the old Washita Indian tribe that settled in and around that region. We also have, in the western part of Arkansas, the Washita Mountain Range, mm -hmm. which is primarily national forest now. It's a beautiful mountain range in the state. So you are not too far from the western border of Arkansas? Well, I was right in the center of the center. state. One, I was actually, in Camden is about uh, right in, in the center of the state, but it's 100 miles uh, south of Little Rock, due south of Little Rock. Little Rock is right in the middle of Arkansas, and then right okay. below that 100 miles is Camden. I'm, I was only about 40 miles, I guess, or uh, 35 miles from the Louisiana border. Right. And um, so I was more of Louisiana than, uh, actually I was closer to Louisiana than I was to Little Rock, actually. Huh. But it was a, it was a small southern town. Uh, the a hundred years ago, they were shipping cotton uh, from the cotton fields of Arkansas uh, uh, down Washington Street, down to the Washita River, which ultimately uh, made its way to the Mississippi River. But Camden was an old cotton port for right. cotton and had a lot of cotton gins, a lot of cotton activity. Now there's probably not a uh, hundred acres of cotton in the whole county. It's all pine trees. Hmm. And in Camden was the uh, site of the first um, of the southern of the big southern pulp and paper mills. The International Paper Company came in there in 1927 and uh, employed probably 2,000, 2,500 people. Uh, only two years ago they announced its closing and mm. it was a very sad day mm. and now our little town is suffering. We also suffered from the uh, close down of a lot of the defense industries mm -hmm. and uh, as some of those people say it's time to heat up the war a little bit so we can have some more defense industry. <laughs> industries and jobs for the wrong reason but they have suffered a great deal in employment. employment is very, unemployment is very high in Camden and in Washita County, um, not quite as high as in the Delta region of the state over between Little Rock and Memphis, which is what we would call the, the, the cotton and rice and soybean right. part of the state. That's where they grow it. Well, we grow more rice than any other state in the Union. And what was it like to be born into the prior family? Well, my father, in, in 1938, uh, when I was four, I do not remember this, was um, drafted. They had a group to clean out the courthouse, and he was 38 years of, of age at that time and be had become sort of a young business leader in the community. He was the Chevrolet dealer, and uh, he, he was one of the young business people in the county, and they decided they were going to beat everyone in the courthouse. and. Um, they ran my father for sheriff of the county against a man who had been sheriff for 24 years, Arthur Ellis. And my father didn't know much about politics. But he, it, when he married my mother, my mother had told my father that she might someday be involved in politics. In fact, she had run for office in 1922. She became the first woman in our state ever to seek a political office in Arkansas. Hmm. She ran for clerk of our county. She was soundly defeated by a man named England Plunkett. <laughs> England Plunkett uh, defeated my mother for clerk of the county. But she, she was not married then? She was not married. It was about four, three or four years before her marriage. She was born in 1900, as my dad was. And, um, but my dad won that sheriff's race. He defeated Arthur Ellis. They cleaned out the courthouse. They wore a little brooms they had made up, clean, sweet, and whatever, so he, they cleaned out the courthouse. And uh, my father was sheriff four years only, and then he retired from that and went back to running the car business. I see. So he was not defeated, but he retired as a very potent figure in our county politically. 
but he uh, passed away at age 52 of leukemia. Mm -hmm. They didn't know a lot about leukemia at that time, but he, he it, it, it consumed him very quickly. Right, but he was a citizen of the county. He was a major citizen oh, of yeah, the county. Oh, yeah, he was a very major citizen in Pryor Chevrolet Company, which existed until about uh, 56 or 7 or 8 along in there. Uh, was a was a, a nice business to have, and we sold it. My brother, who inherited the business primarily, decided he wanted to fulfill a lifelong ambition. He went off to seminary. He became a Presbyterian minister. Uh, I became a politician, lawyer, uh, newspaper person. Mm -hmm. I established a little weekly newspaper in my right. hometown mm -hmm. when I graduated from college. There were just there were two just two children. There were it? two sons and two daughters. Uh, mm -hmm. Were you a, where were you in the birth order? Uh, well, let's see. My brother Bill and then my sister Cornelia. She lives in Camden, Arkansas, still. And then myself and my younger sister Eleanor. She lives in Little Rock. And uh, so did my brother is deceased now. He did in fact become a Presbyterian minister, and Bill died of Lou Gehrig's disease mm -hmm. about six years ago. Did he stay in Arkansas as well? He was primarily in Texas most of that time, but he had retired from the ministry. They had moved to northwest Arkansas, and at age 62 or 3, he became a first-year law student, uh, driving a, hmm. a had, he had a lifelong ambition to have a motorcycle, so he got a motorcycle and he became a law student and died while he was a law student in law school of Lou Gehrig's disease. I understand. Now, was there, had, had any of your grandparents been involved in public service or leadership? My grandfather, on my mother's side of the family, my, my, my grandfather and my great-grandfather had all been uh, sheriffs of the county. They had been, and so on my so you had side, three so I had a, a great grandfather, a grandfather, and a father who were sheriffs of the county. And someday, if you would join me, we'll drive down to Camden, Arkansas. We'll go in the courthouse, and on the wall, you will see their pictures. And my grandfather would be, uh, and great grandfather, I'm sure, would both be uh, judged as being a. a Washita County original hippie because their beards <laughs> came down to about their belt line and uh, and uh, they they were the, that was the Newton side of the family that that they were, both were involved in politics. They were both Newtons. They were both Newtons and and I think that a lot of the of the politics I guess you'd say that by osmosis that I picked up is because my father was in politics and he was. Uh, for a time the sheriff while I was a youngster and uh, my mother was involved in a lot of civic uh, events. Did you know your grandfather? Affairs. Did not. I never mm. knew either mm -hmm. any of my, I knew my grandmother, my mother's mother is right. the only one of the grandparents. But I used to hang around the courthouse a lot. You did? And, and when my father was the sheriff we had a wonderful woman, an African American woman whose mother was a slave actually. And her name was Mary Elizabeth McFadden Cooper Heard Wilburn, and she came to work the, for our Whoa. family the day I was born. Uh, pardon Rescue. the day I was born, and she, uh, Mary, uh, worked for us for some thirty-three years. Was she your mammy? She was. I guess you would say she was my mammy, and yeah. and she did all the cooking, and she came early in the morning, and I would always walk down to the corner, and I could watch Mary walk from her. Uh, uh, her home or uh, part of her way and she would walk uh, down and then up California Street and I would meet her on the top of California Street and then we would walk together to Washington Street where I was growing up and um, Mary was a Mary was truly a part of our uh, family and uh, she when we went on family vacations in the summer where we would go Mary would go with us. She just was part of us. And um, and she had a great influence on me and many of the old, um, let's see, the cadences and the rhythms of, I guess you would say storytelling and memories and, and telling people about events and things and, and descriptions and descriptive um, 
passages I would say that I picked up from from Mary. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I used to do an awful lot when my father was sheriff, oddly enough, it was during the war. Uh, he his, his deputy sheriff was elected after my father and had a stroke, so my father served two of about two or four more years, sort of in an honorary capacity at no salary. Um, and it was during the war, I think it was, yes, it would have been during the war. And uh, Mary, our cook, now she, she cooked for all the prisoners in the jail. And every day at noon, Biggie Young from the courthouse would come with this huge straw basket. Was this when your father was sheriff? Yes, and Mary would bring out the plates and put them on the on Biggie's, he carried this big straw basket on his arm, and he, uh, she put all the plates for the prisoners on the in Biggie's basket. And mm. many times I would walk back down to the courthouse. We lived right by town. Probably didn't live over three blocks from the courthouse, or four, probably from the jail. And we would, I would walk back with Biggie and help him feed the the prisoners. Mm. And I was. Gosh, I was probably eight, seven, six. I was going to say, this has this very formative period in your time. Very, very your, formative. Your father was sheriff, you were a young but boy. I, I stayed around the courthouse right. a lot, and many times when speakers would come uh, to the courthouse to speak, um, for example, I could take you right now in Camden, Arkansas, across the street from the courthouse, and I could show you where a man named J. William Fulbright drove his car and parked it to come and speak at the courthouse one afternoon when he was running for the Senate, and I was mm. 10 years old. Mm. And this would have been in 1944. Mm -hmm. And he drove his car, he parked it there. He was a congressman, he was running for the Senate. First time he'd run. First time he'd run for the Senate. And what, ha what would happen is the day before or during the morning throughout the county, they would send in trucks or cars with big, huge speakers on the top, and they would play music and they'd say, they'd say, J.W. Fulbright will be at the courthouse at 2 o'clock Tuesday afternoon. And, or Ben Laney, candidate for governor, will run. Uh, will, and by the way, he was our next door neighbor and he was elected governor on a fluke. Hmm. Kind of a part of our family to some extent, Ben Laney was. Called it Business Ben. But uh, Business Ben was elected from Camden as a sort of a. Um, total surprise to everybody in the state, especially everyone in Camden, my hometown. But but uh, they these speakers would come. Uncle Mac McCrell would come and bring his, he had about four or five guys that played the fiddles and he would, they, it was festive, it was a circus, it was, uh, it was entertainment, mm -hmm. it was uh, something going on and, and um, it was colorful, it was showbiz and and everyone in town would, you know, they'd close up their businesses and they would come over and, and the ladies would all come with fans and sit out there on the hot summer afternoons. That's when we had primaries in the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, the thing, we, we now have our primaries in the spring in May. And David, the reason we changed from summer, July and August to our primaries, we changed that in 1970. Two or 1970, 1972, I believe. And the reason we changed it and moved those primaries from summer to spring was to accommodate a man named Wilbur D. Mills, Congressman <laughs> Mills, who wanted to run for president and had to get the summer primary. He wanted to be an earlier primary election in Arkansas so he could get through his primaries and whatever. And then he could run for president. So he'd run for president and didn't want to wait until. <laughs> July and August, so and he didn't want July and August elections while they were having conventions sure, and right, so forth. Right. So, the state accommodated Wilbur D. Mills in his quest to be president yeah. and change yeah. move the primaries yeah. up. Were people in politics uh, in that part of the country uh, almost more important in your life than people in business? Yeah, I didn't think much about business. Uh, yeah, because you I, just, it was the My politics. father was a business person. My mother was a civic activist. I'd say an activist. She was a very active in the community. And she started over in what we call South, South Camden, where a lot of underprivileged people lived. My mother started something known as the Community House. It no longer exists, but the Community House was a place 
for underprivileged children whose parents were working uh, or sometimes incapable of taking care of these uh, ch uh, children after school, they would come to the community house. They had ping pong and card games and dominoes and it was a place for them to come and then they, when their parents got off from work, sometimes six o'clock, sometimes eight or nine o'clock at night, they'd come by the community house and pick their children up right. and go about their business. But it was an interim place for, for them to come. But back to the courthouse and whatever, uh, we didn't have general elections to speak of at that time. We had in our county, during that period when I was 10, 15, 10, 12, 15 years old or whatever, we had, as far as I know, only one Republican in the county, hmm. and his name was uh, Skidmore Willis. I asked my father one day in the courthouse, in the post office, I said, Dad, who is that man over there? He was in a black suit and had on a black hat. And he said, oh, son, that's, you don't want to know. I said, no, who is he? He said, well, his name is Skidmore Willis. And he was a old, much older man. I said, well, what about him? He said, well, you don't want to know. And I said, no, what about him? He said, well, son, He's a Republican. And I said, well, what is a Republican? He said, you'll know soon enough. <laughs> so that, he was the only uh, uh, Republican in our county that I knew of. He had a daughter, and her name was Mary Ruth Willis. And my older brother one day took Mary Ruth to a, a matinee uh, one Saturday afternoon. And my father found out about it and, and I think tanned my brother's hide for <laughs> having a date with a Republican. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, it, it was pretty strong. I see. You know, so politics strong. was in your blood. And so politics was, democratic was politics. part of our lives, yeah. Yeah. and and I, I, uh, I'd love. I remember election nights down on the courthouse lawn in the summer, and they had a huge board, and they would bring the boxes in from Amy and Chittister and Red Hill and Ogemaw and Luann and and. And uh, all of the little Elliot, all the little rural boxes, they would bring them in and post them, you know, up on the board. And and it was a, it was it was entertainment. It was fun, and um, uh, it was exciting. And that's what we talked about around hmm. the. Did the you get involved table. in any campaign? I worked for a couple of people, just like for two or three dollars, they'd pay me to hand out their. Uh, cards or something like right. that. You know, I remember one time this funny guy, I may have mentioned him earlier, Uncle Mac McCrell, he he was a, a, an old, kind of a old preacher type, and he carried a Bible, and you would ask him, a New Testament, I guess, and carried it in his shirt pocket. If anybody asked him any question about any position, whatever, or any stand that he might have on taxes or sin or anything, he would say, you just read this book, you'll know what my campaign's all about. And so that was Uncle Mac McCrell. He was one of the real colorful old political characters in the state. And he ran almost each year, for uh, every two years for something. Mm -hmm. We only had term, uh, 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 governor was elected for a two-year term at that time. Mm -hmm. So there was a constant embroilment, embroiling uh, situation uh, uh, with regard to the uh, the governor's races and then the congressional and senate races, but people cared more about at that time. They really cared more about who was their sheriff and their county judge. County judge in Arkansas builds the roads, the local roads. Right. They cared more about who the judge and the sheriff were than they did who the U.S. senator was. Hmm. Or who the government Those were the most two, two more, most important political positions That's in the it. county. And if you had a hot sheriff's race or a hot judge's race, then you could you could pretty well ascertain or predict about what size turnout of, of you were going to have in in the in the voting in the, uh, the primaries. So. And still, till this day, till this day, if you have a hot race for a judge or sheriff, especially in the southern counties of the state. Um, there's still a lot of that that seeps over in today, into the, the elections of today. And if you have a real hot local race for sheriff or judge, you're going to see a, a much larger turnout. Hmm. Because as Tip O'Neill says, all politics is local, and this is local politics at, at its best or at its worst. 
And so um, it, it, I, I always liked it. I, I thought it was fun and it's, um, you know, it's dealing with people and their problems and hopes and dreams and families and, you know, you, there's no way you can be in business and sort of um, intertwine, I guess you would say, into families and worlds of other people and connect your own world with theirs and theirs with yours like politics. And um, it's, it's, an, it's been a wonderful trip. Did you know by the age of 10 or 12 you were likely to be involved in politics? It's real funny. My dad thought that, uh, my dad only went through the eighth grade and then he had to drop out of school and he uh, had to drop out and, and his father became very ill and died about 20 miles from Camden at a little community, Holly Springs, right on the border of actually Holly Springs. The county line went right through it. Part of the little town was in Dallas County and part was in Washita County. But we, they had a little general mercantile store. And my, my father's father passed away suddenly, I think. And he had to drop out of school in eighth grade, or right after the eighth grade, and never went back to school. He didn't, only, I only know, know of him, re he was a fabulous businessman. He was just had a knack for values, and he had a wonderful way of selling things. And if someone he knew was just salivating for a particular automobile that was on the showroom floor, they would come in and talk to him and say, oh, you know, Joe, I, I don't know if, I don't know if you really could afford that car or not. You know, he would, and before you know it, this guy was climbing over his desk to, you know, <laughs> buy the car. And he would keep his kids and wife from buying shoes in order to have that car out there. But he had a great knack for trading and bartering and trading land, and he he bought and sold a lot of land. And he was sitting there in a car dealership where and. Uh, he also wound up with a whole drawer full of oil leases uh, from South Arkansas. H.L. Hunt actually struck his first well right there about 12 right. miles from Camden. So he was entrepreneurial. He was, but by the way, the oil leases never, none yeah. of them ever worked. But he did, he was very successful in land transactions and buying and selling timber and right. things like that. And mm. take, he would take land in on cars. And but he thought you were going to go into politics? I'll never will forget one of our most embarrassing moments. He took me to the Rotary Club. We had a young governor, 32 years old, Sidney Sanders McMath, dynamic young Marine, and he was from Hot Springs, and he cleaned out the gamblers from Hot Springs, and really a wonderful man. I interviewed him for our public broadcast stations recently, we did six hours of, of interviewing just like this. Mm -hmm. And he's now uh, approaching 90, Sid McMath is, um, straight as an arrow, mind is wonderful, he's had a stroke, he's lost his eyesight. Uh, has a wonderful attitude about life, and Sidney McMath was one of the young progressive governors, not only of the South, but of the country, and Harry Truman almost chose Sid McMath to be his vice presidential running mate in 1948. Um, I guess he chose Barkley, uh, Alvin Barkley right. of Kentucky, but he, he thought he was going to, to choose Sidney McMath. Sidney McMath was fabulous. He became one of the preeminent trial lawyers of America. And he was defeated by um, uh, forces that some beyond his control, but anyway, that's another story. But uh, my, Sidney McMath was going to speak one day at the Camden Rotary Club. My father was a member, and so he got me out of school to go hear Governor McMath, this dynamic young governor who was coming into town from Little Rock to speak to the Rotary Club. So I went. I didn't know much about it. But I'll never forget it. It was so embarrassing because my, they met in the back of the hotel, and the, rot, the Rotarians did, and my father got up. I guess he was in charge of the program that day or something. But he got up and maybe people introduced their guests. He said, I'd like to introduce my guest who is my son. Someday will be governor of Arkansas. Well, he did? I, oh, my gosh. I was so embarrassed. I'd, How old were you then? Oh, I was uh, probably 14 to <laughs> 15. But it was, I was very embarrassed. You know, I said, please don't ever do that again. He just, he hauled and laughed about it. But he always thought that I was going to be. And, because? I guess he had watched me. I 
started running for third grade president and I ran every year for president of the class and every year I got elected. You started running, first ran time you ran for office in With third grade? Third grade, yeah, I ran for president in third grade. And I guess my dad saw that that was my thing, was politics and people and, and um, I guess he sensed it. Mm -hmm. I also think my mother sensed it, and I also think my mother really feared uh, and really disliked politics. She didn't like it, she, even though she even was though she an activist. herself. She was an activist, and she had run herself, and she was defeated, and her father and grandfather were sheriffs of the county. But I think she saw that how much time it took away from the family, the husband, and the I don't want to say it broke the family apart, but separated the family time-wise. And there were a lot of times that the, whoever was involved in political races, you know, would be gone and stay gone a day or two, and, you know. So uh, I think she feared what it did to families and mm -hmm. things of that sort, you know, that sort of so, concern a mother would have. Yeah. I guess. So David Pryor runs for third grade president yeah. of Williams. And did you run, you ran there in, in subsequent years? How, how yeah, I, yeah I, the story about that, I, I said, I was out there and I was in Mary Bragg Wheeler's third grade class and there were three or four of us running for class president. We stood out in the hall while they counted the vote or made speeches about us or something. And, and uh, she came out ultimately and I was out there giving a little prayer. I said, dear God, if I can just get elected president of the third grade, then that's all I want. I, that'll, that'll take care of me. <laughs> well, before she came out and says, David, you're the president of third grade. Congratulations. And I walked back. And I was, before I took my seat, I was trying to figure out a way to become president of the fourth grade. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was, it's an old Camden story. They, some of the old settlers still talk about, but I was president every year of the cl of my class. In fact, I hate to tell you, but May 31st, May the 31st, I'm trying to decide whether to do this or not. In Camden, Arkansas, we are having our 50th, mm -hmm. 50th. How sure are you? I How graduated sure you? in 1952. Right. And uh, I, I, I was not president of the class at last year. I was president of the student body. Of Camden but, but, High School. But were you present in your class every year through the 11th grade and then the 12th grade, you're present in the student body? Right, of Camden High School. Of Camden High School. Camden High School, uh, oddly enough, no longer exists. It was yeah. closed down. It was, it was uh, deemed to be by the federal court system. Uh, it, it was not all white, but they said that the racial makeup was not such that it was a fair representation, and they made the schools and the county combine into one, basically one larger high school. Right. How large a high school was it when you were there? Well, when, my, there were 82 people in my class graduating. In your class graduating. And in, it was a four-year high school? Three-year three high school? It was a, a three-year high, three high school. Well, actually, the, all the junior high and the high school went to school together. Yeah. I see. We all went to school together. Sure. So it was a pretty good little-sized high school. Yeah. But there was a high school for... Uh, Lincoln High School, and it was a separate high school, and this was really early on, uh, but I remember Lincoln High well. They had their own football team, own band, own school, own superintendent, and and, and that was the high school where the African American students went and the white students went to Camden, and there was a terrible division between the races. Mm -hmm. and, and there was... You there probably was, weren't, you, it probably didn't strike you at the time as being... Didn't strike me at the time. In fact, on Saturday mornings, uh, I grew up. I would go after. I would go over to the football field at nine o'clock, and and uh, the Lincoln High School football players and the Camden High School. This is more true in junior high than any. We would all meet over there on Saturday morning and play football, hmm. you know, with and against each other, and you know, divide mm -hmm. up teams. Mm -hmm. Were you playing ball? I was playing ball. In fact, when I was a senior in high school, I was captain of the football team. Oh, you were? What and, position did you well, play? Well, I played quarterback. But mm -hmm. we played so you were president of the student body, yeah. captain of the team, and quarterback. Yeah, but we had, a, uh, we had the old uh, double wing found, uh, 
formation, and I played tailback. And mm -hmm. uh, but we were the Camden Panthers, and and that was quite a. It was a, it was a good town to grow up in. But looking back at the town in retrospect, um, there was an awful huge wall of separation. Mm -hmm. uh, no water fountains uh, had white and colored written right. on them. Uh, the bus station was totally segregated. The courthouse was uh, segregated, of course. There, mm -hmm. were no, uh, there, was, there was never a thought, I guess, of having um, anyone but a white person being elected to office. They had the poll tax then, David, and the poll mm -hmm. tax was a pretty I always thought it was a pretty cruel sort of a tax. It was a, a tax that only cost a dollar, but people might who might be working, say, 15 or 20 people in there or would go and buy poll taxes for the employees. And then in all likelihood, they would probably vote, go and vote those, those poll taxes. And uh, fortunately for me, it came to be my opportunity in the early 60s to uh, be a part of a movement in the state legislature when I was elected, to be a part of the Young Turk movement which abolished the poll tax hmm. forever. And we caused some election reform to occur. Those were the fallbus years. Those are tough, mean years. And um, I've seen some of my neighbors whipped into frenzies over the race issue and um, I look back and I guess I think of Margaret Thatcher don't go in what you don't go in wobbly or something don't go wobbly don't go wobbly and I, I, I sometimes feel in looking back I feel like I was going in wobbly oftentimes and, and especially in the race issue ultimately when I took on Falbus and I ran against Falbus for governor, but ultimately, or he ran against me. He came out of retirement to keep me from being governor because we had always fought. But I, I look back and wish that I had been bolder about it. I wish I'd been, for example, I wish I'd been in Selma. I wish I'd been marching over the mm -hmm. bridge. I wish I'd been, I wish my passion had been such that it would have translated into more action. I think sometimes I was too passive about mm. it. Mm. And I look back and I say, why wasn't I there? Why didn't I do that? Mm. Where was I during the bombing in 63? Where, why wasn't I there on the forefront? I was, I'd gone back to law school late, actually, at that time. I was a law student, and I was in the legislature at the, at the, same, at the same time. One of my real regrets, too, and I, this is one of the sorest subjects in my political career, and I, I don't guess I've ever really talked about it. But one night, uh, George Wallace came to Arkansas, and I was governor. He came to Arkansas to speak, and he had moderated. He had moderated a great deal. It was right as he was making his apologies to the to for his racial positions. He may not have even gotten there yet. Uh, graduated to that point, but I introduced him. He spoke to a large banquet. He, he, oddly enough, it was a it was a banquet of the Arkansas Catfish Farmers Association, which would be a pretty powerful group of people. Big landowners had big catfish operations, sold mm -hmm. catfish all over mm -hmm. the world. But um, I introduced him, and I made a mistake of calling him a great American, and I shouldn't have done that. And the press played that up. A great. And what year was that? Well, that would have been seventy-five. Because that was after he was shot. Oh yeah, after he was shot in seventy-two. And I was yeah. in Fort Smith, Arkansas, the day he was shot. I'll never forget. And then I, I had served with George Wallace as governor, and he was a lonely guy. He was deaf. He had he, he had problems with his. Um, urinary tracts and all all of that with his um, because of the shooting yeah oh, oh he was paralyzed and and uh, I used the word I shouldn't have said great American and I always regretted it in the state paper the Gazette uh, took after me 
for making that sort of introduction of George Washington. It was a bad choice of words. I had just been visiting with him at the head table, and he was, I, I felt for the guy. I just felt for him, and I probably did this. Mm -hmm. It probably wasn't written out or anything. Mm -hmm. I just probably did it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, those are little things that you remember. Yeah, but, yeah. I uh, want to come back yeah, and fill okay, in a little sure. bit between, because uh, uh, it, so you leave this high school. You've been a you know, this this star player and and star, <laughs> star performer, yeah. and you go on. Did you go? You you did not go directly to the University of Arkansas. No, I went first to Henderson College, and one reason I did is right as I was getting ready to go to college in that summer, my family went to Europe that summer, 1952. And uh, that was uh, my high school graduation for my mother and my sister and I to go to Europe. My dad sent us to Europe. And um, we spent the summer there, and I didn't know where I was going to go to college. And during, when we got back, my father discovered that he had leukemia and uh, evidently only had a short time and was going for treatment. So I just suddenly decided one night late that I would go to Henderson College. Which was nearby. Which was nearby, about 60 miles away. So I went one year to Henderson. And that kept you in touch with your father. Yeah, well, he died actually the first week I was there. He died the first week I was in college. Wow. So I came back, and, and I'll never forget, after spending the four, five, six days during the funeral business and all like that, I drove back over to Arkansas, so I drove on to the campus, and uh, little to my knowledge that I know I really it was a total surprise I'll never forget the feeling I had and I was pretty blue lost my dad and whatever and I drove back on the campus of this little school pretty little school and um, across little did I know that a movement had surfaced to elect me president of the freshman class at Henderson there was a banner across the road as I drove up on the campus and it says David Pryor for president of freshman class. Well, I was elected president of freshman class at Henderson. So the next year I did transfer, in fact, to Fayetteville to the University of Arkansas. Now, politics at Fayetteville, I imagine, was pretty intense at the university. It was. I, I joined a fraternity. I became a SAE, Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity. My brother had been an SAE before that. He was not a big fraternity person. But I, I became an SAE and I Immediately, I guess I was, uh, yeah, I was elected president of the pledge class, and um, I don't know why people keep kept electing me to all this stuff, but they mm -hmm. did. But I was elected president of the pledge class, and maybe president of the interfraternity council, and things of that sort. Did you ever run for president of the student body? I did not. Uh, a good friend, when I was thinking about getting ready to run for president of the student body, a good friend of mine came to me and said. I'm going to run for president of the, you know, of the student body, and I want your support. And I said, okay. So I supported him. And um, I'd had a lot of things, though. Um, I'd done a lot of stuff on the campus, and it, it was okay. I was fine with were you, it. Were you considered quite a big man on campus? Were you? Oh, I hate to say that, but I, I, I was an active <laughs> I was active anyway, so I don't think I, yeah. was, big, but yeah. I, was, I was very active. Now, my senior year, I met Barbara Lunsford, and, and Barbara's been my wonderful wife now some 45 years. Now, was, she, was she there in, in She was a freshman in college and, yeah, at, at, the, at, our, at the university. Uh -huh. And when we married, she was actually 19 or just about 20, and I had just graduated. And, and we moved on 300 miles south down to Camden, and I didn't have a job. And I, I thought because I had been what I thought a big man on campus, I thought 40 or 50 companies would be trying to hire me and whatever. Well, it didn't work out that way. You know, no one was trying to hire me. I had a degree in political science. And so we went to Camden, and um, we started. I, I started a weekly newspaper hmm. there. and. I saw what was happening with the Fulbus deal, and I had written for the school paper, like I guess similar to the Harvard Crimson. It was the daily paper, the Arkansas Traveler. Right. Mm -hmm. My roommate, uh, Ken Danforth, who ultimately went with Time Magazine, 
and was uh, assigned to Vietnam. But Ken was my roommate in Ms. Bates' rooming house on the third floor, and uh, he was the editor of The Traveler, and he asked me to... I wrote. I did a lot of editorial writing for The Traveler and uh-huh. got sensitized to a lot of issues, and and, um, and it was... Uh, it was a good experience, well, and so I, then I we started our own newspaper. I couldn't get a job, so I started couldn't yeah. get a job on newspaper. I had no experience, so I started my own newspaper. <laughs> How did it do? We ended up having that paper for four years. Um, I had the paper was a terrible financial drain. I had inherited a little bit of nest egg when my father passed away, and. Uh, that nest egg evaporated very quickly in about the first year, hmm. and first two years maybe. And I just kept every month putting more money and more money into the paper. I had to buy an old, we didn't have offset at that time. I bought an old linotype up in mm-hmm. Iowa, I mean a mealy flatbed press up in Iowa and bought an interest in a little print shop and uh, we started a newspaper from literally scratch. and. Um, Oh, we had all kind of gimmicky deals on uh, subscribing to the Washita Citizen, and but the daily newspaper there, which now is a part of the uh, uh, Hussman Newspaper Empire that owns the Democrat Gazette, which ultimately took down the Gazette. Uh, I uh, that I, I was in competition with that local newspaper. And they were a daily. They had all of the Kroger and Safeway ads, right. and Chevrolet, Ford, Pontiac. All. The national ads all go to a daily if you have right. a daily versus a weekly. We ended up with about 3500 circulation, $3 a year. It came out every Thursday. Grand experience. Learned a lot about, I certainly learned a lot about our county. I learned a lot about myself. Uh, and then I ran for the state legislature, and you were 25 when you first ran for political. Office. I think I was 25, and I ran for the state legislature against an incumbent, a very, very strong incumbent who had. And our county was kind of a labor county because of international paper. Right, you were running for the for the House of representatives. Uh, st- for the state House of representatives, right. yes, and this was 1960. Right. And all the labor guys said, "Oh man, we've got to go with Mr. Andrews. He's been with us, and what have you." And, He's been our friend, and so we we got a grid of the county. We just divided up the county, and I guess my wife and I went to probably 75% of the homes in our county. Knocking doors. Knocking door. on doors, and we, we won by a big vote. Um, Had the other guy gotten a little lazy? He'd gotten lazy, yeah, he'd gotten lazy. And okay. he thought the labor guys would carry him in. Faubus group in Little Rock was going to take care of the rest. And now, was Faubus governor at that time? Faubus He'd been governor, governor since when? Faubus was governor, and I'd been blasting him in my little newspaper. He'd been, so. he'd been elected in the 50s. He, uh, Faubus was elected first in the in the election of 1954. Mm-hmm. He was a surprise candidate, last-minute candidate. Roy Reed has written a beautiful book. Uh, on the on the life of Orville Eugene Faubus. Mm-hmm. Faubus graduated from high school at age 26. Now, when did, I, when did Eisenhower send in the troops? 57. 57. Uh, and September. you were, the, you had your And that papers. is just when I was starting my paper. I started in October, about right. six weeks after the Central High crisis erupted. And I started taking Faubus to task. The Gazette and my little poor paper and two or three other papers in the state. And by the way, I think that I think that independent weekly and daily papers that we had during that period of time uh, was our salvation. Hmm. And I think too that it made us different from Mississippi. It made us different from Louisiana. They didn't have this. The only independent voice in journalism, or the most independent voice in journalism, was right across the river in Mississippi and in, in Greenville. And that was the Delta Democrat. That was, uh, that was, that was Hottie, Hottie Carter. Carter's that was his paper. paper. And Mr. Carter, I talked to him about starting a newspaper, and I had him to come to Camden and speak to the Rotary Club, mm-hmm. Mr. Carter Sr. 
And I read his book, Where Main Street Meets the River, and that book inspired me. And I said, I can do this. I can start my own paper. And, and I did. And and I, I had taken on Faubus. And so the so-called Faubus crowd in our county said, well, we'll wind this guy up, you know. And so they put all their forces behind me. But um, we overcame it just because it was, it was we just out worked them. We just outworked them. You mean when and this was the newspaper? Yeah, I had taken on Faubus in in my newspaper. And but then, then you, when I ran right. for the legislature in nineteen sixty, you had the you had the Faubus pro Faubus people out against you. Oh yeah, yeah, they were tough against me. But we uh, we I imagine I won that race. They even put an African American man in the race to split off my mm -hmm. my uh, my black vote, my minority vote, and. Um, even that didn't work. Uh, in one, well, anyway. It, was the race, was, were you running on race, racial issues or, or economic progress and race, racial moderation? I was running. I was just running. I don't think we had very many issues. But you were anti Faubus on what basis? Well, I was I was anti Faubus because I thought he was hurting the state. I mm -hmm. thought he was giving us a black eye. And he, he was, he had in 1957, and this, this was 1960, and he was at the peak of his strength. He was voted, he was voted in 58 or 9 as one of the 10 most admired men in the world. Orville Faubus was one of the 10 most admired men in the world. Right. I mean, you, you can't calibrate that, but he was. I mean, Life Magazine, I guess, did that each, each year, or every two years. And... Faubus was up uh, right there as one of the most admired. I mean, he was he was a godlike figure. He was a he was. You can ask Mac McClarty about this, but but he was a mesmerizing speaker. Uh, he had not much formal education, as I say. He graduated from high school at age twenty six or seven, and the reason he did is because usually during his tenth and eleventh and twelfth grade periods, he had to go off to the wheat fields to work in the wheat fields of the lumber mm -hmm. the forests of Oregon or Washington State. He had mm -hmm. to help feed his family mm -hmm. back home, back in back in Arkansas in the hills. But it but it it is a remarkable story. He he was pretty self educated. But he was a he studied he studied speakers and he studied history. Paul was was a history person. Mm -hmm. And, um, Did yeah. the split begin? The state began to split. So you had the pro Faubus and the anti Faubus group, that and you were true. sort of on it the side. It started to split truly in 1957 during the integration crisis, and everybody thought that he was everything was going to be okay. But when the day of the school opening occurred, he sent in the National Guard. He said he he said there's going to be trouble at the school. And the so-called nine students who became the Little Rock Nine, as they attempt, as they approached the school, um, the guard stopped them from entering Central High School, and um, and that that's when it, and he ulti Faubus ultimately closed all of the schools in the county. He closed all the schools in the county. They didn't have where to go to school. White people are black people, mm -hmm. and they moved off to all kind of places. Well, I took the I, you know, I took him to task on that, and he was becoming uh, power does corrupt, and he was be his people were becoming corrupt. His people in the county were becoming corrupt. Uh, liquor licensing, licensing being so gambling in hot sp springs flourishing, um, payoffs to Faubus and payoff to all kind of people. Uh, local politicians and judges and everybody knew it. I mean, it was open uh, gambling in the casinos and it was against the law. You know, everybody knew it. And um, I, I guess I ran on it's time to clean the place up sort of deal. And um, But I, I took on the local, when I took on William S. Andrews this, in 1960, I don't know that it was so much about issues. It was about kind of who's which side are you on, right? You know, right? Um, but I sold my paper shortly after that, 
and went to the legislature. You hadn't been to law school at that point. And I, and I went to the legislature, and right after the legislative session of 60 days, I entered law school hmm. at age 27, mm -hmm. entered law school mm -hmm. in Fayetteville, 200 miles away from Little Rock. And in my next campaign in 1962, when I was running for re-election, they took, my opponent took a picture of the Fayetteville, Arkansas telephone directory, zeroed in on the page of the P's, and there I was listed in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and not in Camden, Arkansas, my hometown. And I was the absentee representative who's supposed to be representing us in the legislature and doesn't even live with his people anymore. So I was... Uh, was that a hard issue for him? Tough. I thought he was going to beat me. He, they put this out in every mailbox in, in the county. Just as I was coming home that summer to campaign in June, the elections were in late July. And who would be my opponent but England Plunkett's son, Charles England Plunkett, then a lawyer. And uh, he and he and I had been the co-captains of the Camden Panther football team together. And the Falbus people had put Charles in this race uh, to keep me out of the legislature. And it was a bloody, bloody race because it was old family, two old, two old Washita County families. The Plunkett's versus the Priors. Yeah, and the Plunkett's versus the Priors. And um, we, we had a battle royal. And he was saying, you know, David doesn't even live here anymore. He's gone off and lives up there in the hills of Fayetteville, Arkansas. Here's the phone book, you know. And, boy, it was hurting. It was hurting. They overplayed that. They overplayed that. And I'll tell you what, a unique thing happened. In the legislature, there was another fellow who had left his county and was going back to law school who was in the legislature. At the same time, he, he was and his name was Farrell Falbus, Orville Falbus's son, Farrell. <laughs> and I used the Farrell Falbus face. I said, wait a minute, Governor Falbus's own son doesn't live in Fayetteville anymore. He lives in Fayetteville. Here's his phone number in the Fayetteville telephone book. You know, so I, that helped to blunt it a little bit, but but it was a hard campaign, but I won that. Re I, gosh, I probably won by 65, 35, 65. 40 or something. I won by a big vote by, by the time the election took place. I won by, and one of the nice things, the other night you were nice enough to come to the Loeb house. Who did I invite? And he showed up, but a young Harvard Business School student named Mark Plunkett, Charles Plunkett's son. Wow. He was in the Harvard Business. I said, now Mark, I want you to come to this little get together at the Loeb house. So he did. Huh. And I will see Charles at our reunion if I go May 30th, if I go down there. I said the last reunion, I'll never go to another one. But anyway, I'll, I bet I'll end up. There. I think you'll go. I, I, you, I, I President think, of Student Body. Yeah, I think I'll, I probably will go. But uh, those were, you know, I, all that's just nonsense and trivia. But Well, it's not because you had a long record yeah, of, uh, of, of leadership. Law, you know, by the time you were 25... You must have been elected about 15 times. Different the thing things. that, the, the, the real power at that time in the state, each county had a fiefdom, a fiefdom, I say, some people say I say fiefdom. And it was, it was run by the, your local county judge, right. 75 counties, and the county judge was the kingpin. Right. They built the roads. They took no, right. no bids on equipment. They bought road graders and bridge timbers and gravel and cement and, they up they have upkeep of bridges and all this stuff and they had they had an enormous amount of power. They had no judicial power except the only judicial power they had under our eighteen seventy four constitution. They were the judges in bastardy proceedings. <laughs> the county judge was the judge in bastardy proceedings. That's since been eliminated. That was their judicial power. That was their judicial power. That's how they got to be known as judge. So, but they should have been called county, county administrator. Yeah, the county commissioner. Yeah, fact. that's yeah. it. That's I mean, they ran the county, yeah, but county supervisor. they didn't have to take any bids. And many of them, even though their salary was like $7,000 a year, many of them had gotten, had gotten filthy rich. Well, everybody knew how they were getting rich. 
you know. They didn't have to take any bids. They, they took no bids. They got payments from the con road contractors and equipment dealers. And and they also ran the welfare system. They ran, they doled out food stamps, well, not food stamps, but uh, commodities. You know, they, right. they doled out, they had, they had total authority over the commodity program, so they had the poorest of the poor right on, at their beck and call and right under their heel all the time. And the, they, they really were the king bees. So when I got to the legislature, uh, I decided I'd stir things up a little bit. And I introduced a bill to, to force the county officials on any uh, item over $100 they had to take competitive, three competitive bids. Well, man, you would have thought the world was coming to them. Well, everybody laughed about it. And I got, I think, about eight votes. <laughs> And then the next session, I'd get about 16 votes. The next session, about 33 votes. And I kept pressing the issue. And the, all the papers were for All the newspapers were for me. They said, why in the world? I mean, what, who can vote right. against that? And the county judges would come and lobby their legislators right, and right. threaten to beat them and this, that, and the other. And they'd pack the galleries with all their friends and county employees and, and whatever. And I finally, Falba said to me one night, I'll never forget it, we were at a reception. And the last night, it was 1965, or by that time I was about ready to run for the U.S. Congress, Falba stopped me and he says, says I, don't, I had that bill and I had folks worked up in a good frenzy and I had the papers editorializing for the prior bill and taking bids on purchases and all that stuff reform and I was trying to get a new constitution and all this other stuff. But Falva said to me, he says, uh, I don't think you can pass that bill, that county judge's bill. I said, I'm not sure I might can. He said, I don't think you can. I think you're going to be a few votes short. But if you do, if you pass it, I'll sign it. I said, are you kidding me? And he said, yep. He said, it's time. He said, I know how this works. I know. Falva was not dumb. He said, hmm. if you pass it, it comes to my desk, I'll sign. Well, what they did right at the last, they saw I had the votes. They amended my bill, and they changed the author of the bill to a man named Harry Coley of Columbia County. And Representative Coley passed the bill, but it became the Coley bill and not the prior bill. <laughs> and they just changed his name, I think, one word or something like that. <laughs> But Harry went to his grave regretting that because he and he told me he said you know I did it before my judge and they didn't want you to get credit for it and I shouldn't have done. But he 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 truly fifty times apologized well, to me for that. Harry Coley. Well, well, but I'm I'm well, wondering. No, I know you're but I wondering. Took, I, I finally uh, passed that bill. I promised you. You got to go. That that I and I've got to go. I've got to go. We're going to have to come back and do some oh, more of this. Can you? When, I want you to. It was Pretty well on its way out, I guess. I guess. Let's see. Was Franklin Roosevelt president? Yeah, I guess he <laughs> was president. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Do you have memories of uh, growing up in rural Arkansas? That that was it was rural. What that part of the country? It was small town. Our town had probably at that time under ten thousand people, uh, or around ten thousand. Camden was the county seat of our county, Washita County. Washita County and uh, was named for the Washita River, and the old Washita Indian tribe that settled in and around that region. We also have, in the western part of Arkansas, the Washita Mountain Range, mm -hmm. which is primarily national forest now. It's a beautiful mountain range in the state. So you are not too far from the western border of Arkansas. Well, I was right in the center of the center. state. One, I was actually in Camden. Is about. Uh, right in, in the center of the state, but it's 100 miles uh, south of Little Rock, due south of Little Rock. Little Rock is right in the middle of Arkansas, and then right okay. below that 100 miles is Camden. I'm, I was only about 40 miles, I guess, or uh, 35 miles from the Louisiana border. Right. And um, so I was more of Louisiana than, um, actually I was closer to Louisiana than I was to Little Rock, actually. Huh. But it was a, it was a small southern town. A uh, hundred years ago, they were shipping cotton uh, from the cotton fields of Arkansas uh, 
uh, driving a, hmm. a had he had a lifelong ambition to have a motorcycle, so he got a motorcycle and he became a law student and died while he was a law student in law school of Lou Gehrig's disease. I understand. Now, was there, had, had any of your grandparents been involved in public service or leadership? My grandfather, on my mother's side of the family, my, my, my grandfather and my great-grandfather had all been uh, sheriffs of the county. They had been. And so on my so you had three side, I had a, a great-grandfather, a grandfather, and a father who were sheriffs of the county. And someday if you would join me, we'll drive down to Camden, Arkansas. We'll go in the courthouse, and on the wall you will see their pictures. And my grandfather would be, uh, I'm, and great-grandfather, I'm sure, would both be uh, judged as being a, a Washita County original hippie because their beards <laughs> came down to about their belt line and uh, and uh, they they were that was the Newton side of the family that that they were, both were involved in politics. They were both Newtons. They were both Newtons, and and I think that a lot of the of the politics, I guess you'd say that by osmosis that I picked up is because my father was in politics and he was. Uh, for a time the sheriff while I was a youngster. And uh, my mother was involved in a lot of civic. Uh, when I was four, I do not remember this, was um, drafted. They had a group to clean out the courthouse. And he was 38 years of, of age at that time and be had become sort of a young business leader in the community. He was the Chevrolet dealer. And uh, he, he was one of the young business people in the county and they decided they were going to beat everyone in the courthouse and um, they ran my father for sheriff of the county against a man who had been sheriff for 24 years, Arthur Ellis. And my father didn't know much about politics but he, it, when he married my mother, my mother had told my father that she might someday be involved in politics. In fact, she had run for office in 1922. She became the first woman in our state ever to seek a political office in Arkansas. Hmm. She ran for clerk of our county. She was soundly defeated by a man named England Plunkett. <laughs> England Plunkett uh, defeated my mother for clerk of the county. But she, she was not married then? She was not married. It was about four, three or four years before her marriage. She was born in 1900 as my dad was. and. Um, but my dad won that sheriff's race. He defeated Arthur Ellis. They cleaned out the courthouse. They wore little brooms they had made up, clean, sweet, and whatever. So he, they cleaned out the courthouse. And uh, my father was sheriff four years only, and then he retired from that and went back to running the car business. I see. So he was not defeated, but he retired as a very potent figure in our county politically. But he uh, passed away at age 52 of leukemia. Mm -hmm. They didn't know a lot about leukemia at that time, but he, he, it, it consumed him very quickly. Right, but he was a citizen of the county. He was a major citizen oh, of yeah, the county. Oh, yeah, he was a very major citizen in prior Chevrolet Company, which existed until about uh, 56 or 7 or 8 along in there. Uh, was a was a, a nice business to have. And, we sold it. My brother, who inherited the business, primarily decided he wanted to fulfill a lifelong ambition. He went off to seminary. He became a Presbyterian minister. Uh, I became a politician, lawyer, uh, newspaper person. Mm -hmm. I established a little weekly newspaper in my yeah. hometown mm -hmm. when I graduated from college. There were just there were two just two children. There were it? two sons and two daughters. Uh, mm -hmm. Where you a, where were you in the birth order? Uh, well, let's see my brother Bill, and then my sister Cornelia. She lives in Camden, Arkansas still. And then myself and my younger sister Eleanor. She lives in Little Rock. And uh, so did my brother is deceased now. He did in fact become a Presbyterian minister. And Bill died of Lou Gehrig's disease mm -hmm. about six years ago. Did he stay in Arkansas as well? He was primarily in Texas most of that time, but he had retired from the ministry they had moved to northwest Arkansas, and at age 62 or 3, he became a first-year law student uh, down Washington Street, down to the Washita River, which ultimately uh, made its way to the Mississippi River, 
But Camden was an old cotton port for right. cotton and had a lot of cotton gins, a lot of cotton activity. Now there's probably not uh, 100 acres of cotton in the whole county. It's all pine trees. Hmm. And, and Camden was the uh, site of the first um, of the southern of the big southern pulp and paper mills. The International Paper Company came in there in 1927 and uh, employed probably 2,000, 2,500 people. Uh, only two years ago they announced its closing and mm. it was a very sad day mm. and now our little town is suffering. We also suffered from the uh, close down of a lot of the defense industries mm -hmm. and uh, as some of those people say it's time to heat up the war a little bit so we can have some more defense industry. <laughs> That's industries and jobs for the wrong reason but they have suffered a great deal in employment. Employment is very, unemployment is very high in Camden and in Washita County, um, not quite as high as in the Delta region of the state over between Little Rock and Memphis, which is what we would call the, the, the cotton and rice and soybean right. part of the state. That's where they grow it. Well, we grow more rice than any other state in the Union. And what was it like to be born into the prior family? Well, my father in 1938 